C.S. Lewis has this idea called the great dance. And it's, it capitalizes it. Uh, it's basically the idea that everything that's happening everywhere is happening all together. And that everything is connected. In one way or another, every event affects every other event. And any given event is affected by so many causes that it, the, the intricacy is, is insane. And so it's really C.S. Lewis's idea about God's sovereignty, which is, of course, the idea that God rules over absolutely everything, even the smallest details in life. His idea of the great dance, it goes beyond things like the physical world. I mean, everyone can see how the physical world works together. That's where science you know, draws so much from. It's fascinating how the world of plants and animals, it all works together and everything relies on each other. You start taking animals out of ecosystems and they start breaking down. So we can all see that, but the great dance goes beyond that, even to things like human behavior, which seems random, which seems sporadic. Even things like movements in nations and upheavals and revolutions and all that stuff, everything that happens in human activity is also governed ultimately by God. He's orchestrating everything and everything's working together. For C.S. Lewis, this goes even beyond, though, the realm of human activity to angelic activity, what the angels do and how they move and how they marshal it and what Satan and his minions do. All of it God works in and through, and, and he's over it. And everything, if we could see, which we can't, but if we could see, we would see everything working together like a tapestry, telling one great story. Uh, this is how he puts it in, in one of his novels. In the plan of the great dance, plans without number interlock. And each movement becomes in its season the breaking into flower of the whole design to which everything else had been directed. He talks about it like, if you look at any given thing, it's like, it seems like it's, it must be the center, the center of what's going on. Important things happen all the time. Important things happen in our lives. And it's like, this has to be like the center of something. And yet if you look for a center, there's no center. Everything's the center. And yet nothing is the center. If you look at like an epic battle between beetles or something like that in the bug kingdom, you've got to think, yo, like, this is epic. This is significant. There's meaning here. And then how much more in our own lives, the things we go through. Amazing things that people experience that no one else ever even hears or knows about. Those are significant. They all matter. In a way, they're all the center and everything's connected. Uh, that's Lewis's idea. It's pretty raw. Uh, we're going to use that idea today when we come to this text. So we'll work our way. To, to hopefully we'll see the connection. Okay, so as we move to this text today and uh, consider the great dance of the Christian life, really, we'll do three things. First, we'll set the scene, what's happening here in this passage. Secondly, we'll consider why Paul went ham on Peter about bacon. That's the second point. And then thirdly, uh, how to dance. How to dance the dance. We'll consider that for just a second. So first, let's set the scene. Okay, Paul says, when Cephas, that's Peter, that's his Jewish name, when Peter came to Antioch. Okay, so that's where everything happened here. What was Antioch? It was a city. There was a church in Antioch, a famous church. It was the church that sent Paul on his missionary journeys. And the thing that was unique about the church in Antioch was it was the first Gentile church. What that means is it was the first church that was not founded within Judaism. The first believers were Jewish, of course, in Jerusalem. When Peter preached, he preached to, to Jewish folks, even co Jewish converts, and they all were converted. But they were all practicing Jews at the time. In Antioch, after the persecution happened, some Jews went and dared to preach Christ to people who were not Jewish. And when they tried their little experiment, they found that a bunch of people got saved. And so this church was founded in Antioch, and it was mad diverse. There was different peoples there from different nations, different cultures, different backgrounds. It's like the ideal diverse church was in Antioch. 
And Paul, it was one of his home bases. That's where he was sent out on mission. So this would have been like, technically, if you got to call it, this is like Paul's home church, home sending church. And he and Barnabas went out from there. And so this is near and dear to Paul. Um, the reason Paul's talking about this in Galatians is because he's trying to make a point. Now, he just kicks the Galatians' butts. He doesn't even care. You know, the Corinthians had some stuff. They were dealing with sin issues in a pretty bad way. But even with that, he's sort of gentle. But the Galatians were messing with the gospel, and Paul was not playing that. So he just he gives them a grace and peace at the beginning of the letter and then just, just goes in on them, the whole joint. And one of his main points is that the gospel he preached to them, he didn't get it from people. It's not a gospel that people made up. He goes, so he, he gets biographical here. He tells them, when I was saved, when he became a Christian, the, the apostles were already in Jerusalem. Peter, John, James, all them cats, they were there preaching and teaching. They were legends by this point. Uh, as soon as Paul got saved, you would think maybe he's going to go meet those guys and sit at their feet and learn from them. That's not what Paul did. Instead, Paul went into the wilderness for three years to learn and receive revelation from God and probably study his Old Testament with fresh eyes. And only after three years, Paul went up to Jerusalem, and only for a couple weeks. He stayed with Peter for a couple weeks, nothing major. He didn't even meet anybody else. But after 14 years, he said, I did go up. And when I went up, I wanted to check the gospel I preached with them because I know I didn't get it from them, but I thought it would be wise to do that. And he tells them, yo, this is, this is what me and Barnabas have been preaching. Christ crucified. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone. That's, you know, he might not use those terms, but that's what it was. And when he did that, they said yes. They gave him the right hand of fellowship, so they were in agreement. They preached the same gospel. But his point to Galatians is, this is what happened. He preached to them, they got saved, but then these slicksters came along after Paul left and said, you know, if you want to be a real Christian, what you have to do is, yes, believe in Christ, but then also you've got to keep the Old Testament law. You've got, to, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the food laws, you've got to do all this stuff. And that sounded pretty reasonable to them because, you know, Bible. So they were being tricked by this. And these guys were saying, you know, Paul's nothing, man. But Paul wants them to know he got his gospel straight from the top. And so he's like name dropping because the top dog is Peter. That's the guy. Everybody knows it. He's the guy who preached first in Jerusalem when the church got saved. He's the head honcho. Peter was probably a little bit older than the other disciples, even, even John and James. So that was the dude. And Paul's being forced here to tell them that Peter was Peter, though he loved Peter and he respected Peter. Even if Peter, though, was going to start messing with the gospel, then he was going to have to even oppose Peter. Okay, so Peter comes to the church at Antioch, which is diverse and which is full of Gentile believers, and he's chilling with everybody. More importantly, he's eating with everybody, and that's the real, that's the real issue here. Uh, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Um, this means that he, he was grubbing with the nations, and they did not keep the Mosaic food laws. You know what I'm saying? They did not keep the strict dietary rules that every Jewish person would have kept from their earliest days. It would have been so ingrained in their thinking, and that's part of the issue here. Peter, he's having a tough time breaking from this. But he knew, Peter knew. Peter had already got a vision. You see this in Acts, I think, Acts 11. Peter got the vision from heaven of all the unclean animals being let down from heaven. And then in the vision, God told him, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, I've never eaten unclean. It was this picture of Gentiles coming to salvation. So Peter should know better, and he does know better. Peter knows he's free in Christ. Peter knows that he's not bound to keep the Mosaic law in that way any longer. It is a thing which is passing away. So he gets down. When, he, when he's with the Gentile believers, he's eating the bacon-wrapped, you know, the bacon-wrapped uh, pork chops and all the stuff, everything. He's grubbing, it's no problem. 
And he's right for that. He doesn't have to do that, perhaps, but he's right for that. He's enjoying his liberty in Christ. And that's all good. But the problem is that when these guys came from Jerusalem, he switched, switched up on them. He switched it up. Before certain men came from James. Now, what does that mean? Well, they came from Jerusalem. It doesn't mean James sent them. So, okay, Peter's the top dog, but when you talk, but Peter's out there preaching. He's kind of on the mission field a little bit. James is like the guy in Jerusalem. He's the, the, like the, the, the lead elder at the church in Jerusalem, and he's so deeply respected, and he's thoroughly Jewish. James, the apostle. And that's all good. Uh, but these men who came from him, doesn't mean he sent them, but these would have been Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, but of a very strict Jewish belief about things like the food laws. They, 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 they observe those very strictly. And when they showed up, Paul says, Peter drew back from the Gentiles, from the brethren. He drew back and separated himself because he feared them. He feared the circumcision party. He was intimidated by them and switched up his whole conduct and acted like a totally different cat when they showed up. Now, you can imagine how the believers in Antioch felt about that. They're starting to feel what they felt in Galatians, that I, it must not be enough. I, I need more. There's more that I need to make me a true Christian. I'm missing something in my gospel. If even Peter is doing this. Ah, it wasn't just Peter even. In verse 13, Paul says, and the rest of the Jews who were already in Antioch, the Jewish believers, they also acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas, now that was his right-hand dude. Cousin Barney, that's his cat. All right? And even Barnabas, who should have known better, did the same thing. So you got to see it from Paul's perspective. The gospel is totally being compromised right before his eyes. Peter's doing it, and literally everyone's following Peter. So that these dudes who showed up from Jerusalem are like, that's right. You know what I'm saying? It's even confirming for them that they're right. You have to do this stuff. All right, that's the scene. But Peter should have known by now, because he already had his vision. But you know what they say? A hard head makes a soft behind, and that's what, that's what Peter's got coming. So that's the scene. Okay, second, why Paul went ham on Peter about bacon. Okay, so Paul snapped. He snapped. In the manga Bible, in this section, it shows Paul going like Super Saiyan or whatever. <laughs> Just flipping out, you know what I'm saying? In Holy Spirit mode, man. Because this was something you don't play with. This was not an issue of Christians disagreeing over conscience. This was more than that. The gospel, the good news, was, was, was being jeopardized by their conduct. And so Paul, yo, Paul, Paul knows when to be moderate, and Paul knows when it's time for war. And that's so much of the Christian life. When we're younger in the faith, we tend to think everything's time for war. It's all war. No, it's not all war. But there are things that will always be war for the Christian, and that is whenever the gospel is attacked or compromised, that's the time for war. It is the central peace. It is the central revelation in Scripture. It's, the whole, it's, it's this whole storyline of the Bible. Everything is the gospel. Okay, so why did Paul snap? Well, he tells us what happened. In verse 14, when I saw that their conduct, separating, fearing people, I didn't say anything, he just watched them do it. When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. That's when he said what he said to Peter. The way they're living didn't match the good news of Christ, and that's a problem. Reminds me of a ghost face killer lyric. 
I seen his feet and they're both lefty. He step in half correctly. That's how, that's how Peter and them was doing it. That was totally out of step, out of rhythm. Two left feet, that's what that is. You can't dance, you got two left feet. And that's what he was doing, yo. His lifestyle was, was, was out of sync and out of tune with the beautiful harmonies of the good news of Christ. And that's a big problem. That's where I'm getting the dance idea from. They weren't dancing correctly. Ah, this is sort of like, uh, there's formal dancing. I've never really experienced that, but there's sort of formal dancing. Lewis picks up on this in Narnia, you know, the fawns and the satires and all them goat-footed creatures. They would, in summer nights in the Narnian woods, they would go through extravagant dances that were coordinated, and it was almost like a game, and everyone had to be exactly where you needed to be at exactly the same time, and they would see how long they could go. They could go, out, they'd go all night sometimes with the dance because everything has to be coordinated together. And if something's out of place, if a foot is just a little bit late or an arm is a little bit early, it's going to mess up the whole, because the dwarves would stand on the outside and throw snowballs through them. So it had to be synced up or else the snowball would hit somebody. So cats would get blasted, they'd laugh their heads off and start over. But the idea here of being in step with the gospel, uh, when it comes to the gospel, there, it's not like you could just freestyle dance, really. There's a way in which it's more of a formal dance in the ways that we must move and live. In so much of the Christian life, there is freedom. But in this, we don't play, it, it, there's no room, there's no wiggle room in this. That didn't match the gospel. In, so how? Okay, so what does it mean that their conduct was out of step with the gospel? Well, it was, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was upsetting the faith of the Christians there. A lot of these Christians, you know, these would have been newer Christians. Some, these are people with no Bible background. It's what you'd call unchurched. They're not, not, not Jewish. They'd, they're unfamiliar. But, but they hear about Jesus Christ and they come to faith in Christ and all this is new to them. And they're being taught by Paul and others. So they, they have some knowledge. But, but, you know, they're so confused probably. Like they enjoy fellowshipping with Peter and they've been told. It's not like it's assumed. Paul and everyone's told them you're free in Christ. You don't have to observe the laws from the Old Testament like that anymore. You're free. Food laws are free. They're being told that, but all of a sudden, the guy who they're having fellowship with, he switches on them. Ah, that would have tore their hearts right out of their chest, man. That, that, that's painful. And Paul here, even though he's angry and fierce, he's being driven by compassion. All Paul's thinking about is the faith of everybody involved. He's trying to safeguard all of their trust in Christ and Christ alone. That's what it is really about. Peter, it says here, acted hypocritically. That gives us some clues. They all did. Peter, Barnabas. To act hypocritically is to act. To be a hypocrite is to act. To like put on a mask, pretend to be somebody else. It's to act contrary to what you really believe. So what that tells us is Peter knew that he was free to eat. He, he knew that he was free from the, the bindings of the Mosaic law like that. He knew that. So did Barnabas, and so did the other Jews who had roots in Antioch. They knew this. But they were pressured out of the fear of man to compromise their beliefs and act as though they now thought, yeah, actually it's sinful to do that. Mm. And that's what, they're, that's what they were communicating by what they were doing. That's how we are. We can communicate so much by just what we do. We want to communicate with words. It's the very best way. It's way more efficient. <laughs> but the way that we act always communicates. And we have to be careful in the Christian life for this, that the things we say we believe, we don't, we don't contradict by the way that we live. An example is to take the great dance. We say we believe God is sovereign. We say we believe God is in control of all things. But it's, ah, we, and that's true. We do believe that. But when things go haywire in my life, it's, that's when it's like rubber meets the road, and that's the real test of if I really believe it. Now, we're going to struggle with that. We're going to struggle with it. But Peter wasn't struggling here. He was just giving in to the thing. 
had a really great insight there, and it's totally gone. So, all right. They were out of step with the gospel. Um, Paul kind of explains himself in the verses after this, which we read. So starting in verse 15. Some scholars believe this is a continuation, like he says all this to Peter. Uh, but it's really explanation here. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. What does that mean? Okay. Well, this means that as a Jew, they were raised with a structure of righteousness. The Mosaic law is full of that structure of righteousness. And for that time, it was sinful for them to disobey that law, including the dietary laws, what you could eat, what you couldn't eat, including circumcision, all that stuff was sinful at the time. And if you were Jewish, you were raised in that structure, and that structure was a benefit. <laughs> it's better to be raised with that structure than without it. When he says Gentile sinners here, he's talking about people who had no scripture. Who had, they had natural revelation. They knew about God and all that. But they didn't have any righteousness basis that gave form to their lives at all beyond natural revelation, which is good, but only goes so far. So Paul's thinking about things like the dietary laws. They gave certain structure. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified or made right with God, that's what the gospel is all about, by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay. What, what, what's he talking about? Well, they're talking about food laws here. It includes more, but talking about food laws here. When he talks about works of the law, he's talking about, obviously, the Mosaic rules about what you can and can't eat. And Paul's saying that we know, Peter knows this too. Peter knows that we're not made right with God by keeping those laws. We're not. Those aren't the things that pay for our sins. Those aren't the things that, that reconcile me back to my Creator. They don't do it. But faith in Christ does it. Faith in Christ alone. So you can see why Paul's being so fierce here because what's happening is they're allowing competitors in. Competitors against Christ so that it's Jesus plus something saves me. Jesus plus circumcision saves me. Jesus plus the food law saved me. Jesus plus works of the law saved me. And that's the whole problem. The, there's no gospel there. And so that's why Paul is tripping about it. Uh, when it comes to works of the law here, of course, scholars are divided about what works of the law means. Because um, Paul talks about this in different places. seems to me that in Galatians here, he's talking about ceremonial works of the law. Things like circumcision, things like food laws, those things you had to do in the Old Testament. In other places, like in Romans, when Paul talks about we're not justified by works of the law, he seems to have more in mind like the Ten Commandments and the moral laws. And scholars make a big deal about dividing these out. Uh, but to me, it seems like it all comes to the same thing in the end. Because what we're talking about is being made right with God by something you do. Whether it's keep an ordinance of the Old Testament, like what you eat or don't eat, or by your performance of righteousness and like being a faithful witness of truth and not being a liar, for instance, or giving worship unto God rather than idols, what we would call more of a moral law. It all comes to the same thing in the end because what we're talking about is justification. We're not justified, he said. And when we talk about justification... We're talking about righteousness. So the problem here is these guys from Jerusalem, they really believe this when they came to Antioch. 
It's like a takeover of the Antioch church. They believe that it's necessary for them. I don't think James taught this to them. <laughs> Maybe Peter's given a little slight. These men came from James. Because James, if he wasn't careful, this could happen. These men believed that you had to do this. Maybe not their doctrinal statement, but it's how they actually lived and believed. And that's why Paul's tripping. Because it's allowing a competitor to Christ. Whether it's the circumcision and all that stuff, or whether it's the moral law and our righteousness before God, it's all the same thing. It's trusting in what we do in addition to trusting in Christ. So that when it comes to your salvation, it's Jesus saves you mostly, but then you save yourself just a little bit by doing the right stuff. And maybe not a lot, but just a little bit. What's it going to hurt? You know what I'm saying? One drop of poison in the glass of wine, well, it's not, not going to hurt. <laughs> yes, it will. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So this is the problem here, and this is what Paul's doing. And that's why he's heated. Because the way that Peter's acting, and the way that Barnabas is acting, is teaching the other believers that what really makes you right with God is this stuff. And you got to give Peter a little bit of mercy. This was a time of growth for the church. And growing periods can be tough, you know. Like when you're going through adolescence into adulthood, it can be a little awkward, you know, that awkward stage. Growth is tough. And we experience things even like, you know, physical growing pains that you get. You know, that, uh, growth is difficult. Growth as a person is difficult. You go out of your comfort zone. It hurts. Da, da, da. Areas of weakness are shown. Growth. That's what the church was going through here. Because this whole old regiment of the food laws and all the mosaic stuff was passing away. And it was really hard for some of those Jewish believers to understand or really get it in their hearts that that stuff was take it or leave it now. It was. It was take it or leave it because it wasn't essential to being made right with God. It never was, but it was Expected, but now it was passing away. So Peter takes a long time to learn this lesson. You know. So we're just a lot like Peter, beloved. That's, what, that's how I feel. Just back and forth and this way and that and so many difficulties for Peter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's why Paul went crazy. Because they were teaching, not by what they were saying, but what they were doing, that to be a real Christian... These are the things you do. These are the things you don't do. And you need this to really enter into the Christian life. It's just false. You don't. Okay, third point, how to dance. We'll talk about this a little. We'll be through. Okay, I can't dance, but my brother can. A couple years ago, my brother made it to the finals in the Milwaukee Bucks. They had a beard competition. And he made it to the finals, so, so he, they brought him out to a game in Milwaukee. And, you know, he had to go to half court. I think it was, it was decided by cheers. But my brother won the competition, the, the beard challenge at the Milwaukee Bucks. And when he won, he did the shimmy at half court. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and according to my brother, James Harden nodded at him after that. <laughs> so my bro's... My bro got all the game in our family when it comes to dancing. No one else got anything. So I can't dance. Um, but there's a way to live like the dance. That's what we're talking about here. For our conduct, the way we think and live, to just be in the rhythm of the good news of Christ. To be in step with it. Not to clash with it, but to go with it. There's a way. For that to be done, even for us who can't dance. <laughs> to match the gospel rhythm. And it seems to me it's all pretty simple here. What Paul's saying here. When it comes to the gospel, there's no cut-ins. You know the classic, you cut in on the dance. May I have this dance? You know what I'm saying? When someone's dancing with someone, you take that. That's, that's a great picture because that's what sin was doing here. 
it was saying to Peter and to Barnabas and to the Gentile believers as they're dancing with Christ in the gospel. They want to cut in, may I have this dance? Behold me. Focus on me. Follow my lead. You know what I'm saying? Their good works were getting in the mix of the movements of grace. And that happens to us all the time. We're like Peter. We know the truth. We know that we're saved by Christ and Christ alone. We know that. We know we're called to a life of holiness. We're called to obey God's commandments. Yes, that we're obligated to that. But we're not obligated to that as the grounds of our salvation. We're obligated to that as a life of gratitude and because that's what's real. But our salvation does not depend on that. That may come in to vindicate our salvation. You know, someone who's really saved will have a pattern of righteousness and that does show that they belong to Christ. But that's not what they're trusting in. Well, at least not all the time. We know that's true. We know that today when I open my eyes and I wake up in the morning that God is smiling down upon me not because I had a great day yesterday. That's not why. It's because of Christ. It's because of what Christ did so very long ago and what will never change. He sits in heaven. He's already, he died for my sins. He rose again. I know that. We all know that on paper. But then as you go through your day, and you have a little difficulty in your day, or you have a really good day maybe, you will be surprised if you pause in those moments to see how much your heart is resting on those things. How much like practical confidence you're getting from that to pray, or how much practical shame you're getting from that. That when you deal with sin, that, you, that you're cut off from God then, you believe. And God, you can't really walk freely with God and worship Him until you clean that entire area of your life up. You have to repent first, get it together, and then you can be received. That happens all the time. And then even more sinister, probably, when things go a little bit well. You know what I'm saying? When God empowers you and crushes sin in your life and you're able to walk in some level of holiness... Your heart, my heart, will instantly start to try to rest on that and will like, be more confident in prayer simply because we're walking in righteousness. Now, it's, a, it's a lot. You know, there's, there's so many nuances here, okay? Lots of kernels here. So obviously, if you have a bad conscience, if you're like living in sin, then your conscience is going to be defiled. And yes, you're going to have shame before God. That's, of course. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the ordinary struggle of the Christian life where we fall and we stumble. That should not affect our confidence before God and our good works ought not to make us more confident before God because what we're saying that, not in our beliefs, but in our practice, what we're saying to the universe is, I'm right with God because I'm holy. It's my own righteousness that makes me really accepted with God. You know what Luther said, if you think your measly, putrid works can please the righteous, holy standard of God, man, it's like so far beyond. We have fallen short. We live entirely by grace. Yes, we want to be holy. We want to walk with God in His truth. I want to be holier and holier and holier. Amen. But the only way to actually get there is by resting on Christ and drawing on His mercy. No competitors, beloved. No competitors in your confidence before God. When you go to God in prayer, you go entirely on Christ and Christ alone. That's it. And it's always that way. When you shrink from God, you're shrinking because you're forgetting what Christ has done. That He has truly accomplished these things. And if God can grant us just a little bit to live in this, to walk in this, to, to, for our conduct to catch up to our doctrine. That doesn't make us right with God either, right? But if we do that, man, that, that whole gospel vibe is just going to go out from us. As we tell people about Jesus, it's going to be matched with that energy 
of our lives that we know. This creates a sort of humbleness that Peter and the, these cats, they, they, didn't, they were losing their humility before God. It's humility that's so central there. And that humble, resting joy in Christ. Man, people can pick up on that. We can pick up on that with each other. There's so much we can do to do that. So, yes, we're all part of the great dance. Whether you're a Christian or not, even the greatest rebels in the universe are part of the great dance. They can't escape God's sovereign plan. Their plans will be thwarted and undone. All the works of the wicked will be undone. They're not able to accomplish what they're trying to do with their works. It will all be righted and all be... So we're all part of that. But when it comes to walking with Christ in the gospel, it's like we want to be more and more in tune with the real music of the spheres there, which is grace, beloved. It's grace, and it is mercy. And on our best days and on our worst days, it is always that. I'm saying, and if you forget it, you know, I'm saying Apostle Paul is going to jump out the wall like the Kool-Aid man and tell you what's good. <laughs> like, here's Johnny style. <laughs> If you are not a Christian today, even if, <laughs> if you are not a believer today, you can trust in Christ now where you sit and be saved entirely and eternally where you sit by faith and faith alone in Christ. If you're a believer who's struggling with sin, you can break the power of that sin through faith in Christ, through rest in the power of the finished work of Christ. You believers who are struggling, cloudy days, discouragements, downcastedness, frustrations in life, the only way to walk through any of that is through trusting in Christ alone, resting in his love for you. He didn't love you for your works. I'm saying it was not our works that drew God to us. It was his mercy and grace. And that will never change, ever. So may he help us rest in Christ today. Let's pray.